All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Memorial Day weekend. So excited to uh, worship together and to celebrate, give tribute to all of our uh, folks who have gone on and paid the ultimate price. We honor all who have served, who do serve. Um, This is just a great time to pay tribute and to honor, and so we just want to say that. All who are here today, thank you. Uh, If you serve or have served, we just appreciate the freedoms that we enjoy because so many are willing to pay the ultimate price, and we know many have. And so uh, this is a big weekend for that. I want to welcome all who are joining us online, our online campus. We're glad that you've tuned in, and we're going to worship the Lord together this morning. I want to introduce our buddy Shane Malley to you. Can we welcome Shane? So... Shane was brought to us, he and his lovely wife, Laura, uh, about six, eight months ago. He is a worship leader up in our Jerseyville campus, doing a fantastic job. And so he has traveled down here this morning, my pastor guy and Kelly are on vacation out of town, and he's going to lead us in worship along with the rest of this awesome team. So let's stand online, just hook in with us, and let's worship the Lord, amen?
we see your evidence, God. I see the evidence of good grace. Come on, church. All over my life. All over my life. I see your promises in the field. All over my life. All over my life. Oh.
of your presence, God. We call upon your name, God. you move the mountains today, God. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Yeah. Call upon the name of the Lord and be
We'll never know how much it cost. We'll never know what Christ really bore that day, that he bore the weight of the sin of you and of me. But he did it so that his name can be above all of those things that the enemy tries to throw at us. His name is above every other name. So that when we call on his name, we rise above every other thing. There's nothing that can keep us down because of what Jesus did that day. Father God, we thank you that you chose to bear our weight, that you chose to carry it all so that we can rise above everything and that you chose to give us authority to walk in your name so that when the enemy comes after us, that we can say in Jesus' name, we have victory. We thank you, Father, and we give you glory and honor. And we declare in this house that your name reigns, Lord God, that your name is above every other name. And we worship your name and your name alone. Thank you, Father. We love you and we give you honor in this house today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you feel victory in this house today? Do you feel victory in your life? Because if you don't, all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus. Amen? Well, we're going to have a powerful message for you. But before we do, greet someone around you with that powerful greeting. Encourage them today, and we'll be right back. All right. Well, once again, good morning, everybody. In church, we welcome all of our new visitors who are joining us, both online and here in person. Can we just give them a round of applause? I know we appreciate them being here. You know, we, uh, we have a, a heart and a desire, and we say often, is that people would be in the local church that God wants them to be, that the Spirit of God will lead and guide those who are seeking him. Uh, the Lord is into positioning. It says he places members of the body in position as he chooses. He's got a role, a function. Uh, and so God has something to say about that. It's important to him. Let me put it that way. Uh, where we decide to put our roots down and make our home church and grow up strong, get fed, and also have a contribution to help grow the body of Christ through that expression in the local church. And so if you're here and you're visiting our prayer is that God would just speak to you. If it's here, great. If God wants you to be somewhere else, we celebrate that too. Uh, but I do believe that if you'll open your heart to him today while you're here, that God will bless you. He'll minister to you 
and he will do something really, really powerful in your life if you'll allow him to do that. So let's just prepare our hearts in the moments ahead. Amen? Hey, we've got a few updates and announcements. I got a video I want you to watch real quick here on the screen. Hello, and welcome to Life Church X, where we are passionate about raising up game changers in every generation. If you're new today, we are so excited that God led you here, and we'd love to invite you to fill out a red card from the chair back in front of you and drop it in the offering box located in the back of the sanctuary so one of our leaders can reach out to you and get to know you better this week. If Life Church X is already your home, now is your opportunity to give. If you're in the building, you could grab an envelope from the chair back in front of you and drop it in the offering boxes. Other ways are to go online to lifechurchx.com or download the mobile app. You can text the amount to the number 84321, or you can simply mail a check to 400 Park Street, Waterloo, Illinois, 62298. And last, join us next weekend for our annual Life Church X picnic. You can visit our website for more details. I pray that God fills you to overflowing today. Let's get ready for a powerful message. Amen. Awesome. Well, I'm excited about that picnic next weekend. Amen. Yeah. Immediately following second service, we'll be out at Lakeview Park here at Waterloo Campus. And uh, I know Miss Nancy's got some awesome things planned for us, right? It's going to be a great day celebrating. Also uh, mentioned kind of at the beginning of service, but just want to say again, if you're here today uh, and you currently serve in our armed forces or National Guard, any capacity or have served, can I just say we honor you? Uh, we appreciate you, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this amazing freedom that we have. And we have that freedom in large part because many are willing to pay the ultimate price to protect that freedom. Everyone who takes a vow, who steps into service, knows that there may come a day. Pray God doesn't bring that day, but there may come a day where that price has to be paid, and willingly, those who serve know that they're prepared to do that if that time comes. And of course, we know this weekend, Memorial Day, is all about the ones who've gone before us, men and women, who have paid that ultimate price with their lives to protect our freedom. Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. It's the ultimate sacrifice. And so we thank those we honor those who've gone before us. We remember them today. And we're also mindful that Jesus himself demonstrated that by laying his own life down, that we would have freedom from sin and bondage and be promised this joyous reward of eternal life with him in heaven after we depart from this earth. And that is something to celebrate. Amen. Amen. Who's ready for a word today? All right. So just to tee this up as we get into the message, um, I'm next week I'm putting on a new series, frankly, that I'm incredibly excited about. Uh, I've been studying and preparing for this one actually for over a year. And some of the messages and series, they just, they just take time to incubate. Um, and God's been just really working this thing in me. And it's called Work is Good. And so I'm going to talk about, because, you know, I obviously get a chance to talk to a lot of people and hear about things that they go through. And I think one of the areas I see a lot of struggle for people in uh, is in their work life. And many people, you know, they dread their work. They hate their work. They compartmentalize work. You know, I got my work life. I got my faith life and all this. And frankly, God has not designed work to operate like that in our lives. Um, and so we're going to tread deeply into some of the truths of Scripture about work, about how we relate to our vocation. I would say that it's a part of the calling and the destiny that God has for us is how we use our gifts and talents and abilities to serve Him vocationally. And I really believe with all my heart that as we go through this series over the number of weeks in June, that there will be workplaces in our communities that are dramatically impacted and transformed because we get a new revelation, a transformational view about how we are approaching what we're doing for the Lord. So I'm excited about that. So this week, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the series coming up, and I'm also preparing a message for today, praying over several messages that were really preach-ready, I would call them, 
And then the Lord on Friday, so about 48 hours ago, uh, did one of those you know, U-turns where he kind of took me back around and where he brought me was really a continuation, if you will, uh, from last week on the goodness of God. So I'm, I'm not really calling this part two, but I tell you all that because I want to get this point across. I think the Lord wanted to take another week to really establish some things in us about his goodness and about how his favor is meant to go with us wherever it is that we go. His goodness is pursuing us. It's chasing us down. His favor operating in our lives is a game changer. It impacts the outcome of what we do more than anything else can. I pray often and frequently in any new endeavor, meeting, situation, whatever it might be, God, let your favor go before me. And there's a confidence of faith that God's goodness is, in fact, going before me, paving the way, but also is with me everywhere that I go. So I feel like part of the intention here that the Lord wants to do is to take an extra week and really get us grounded in this spiritual truth of God's goodness, of His favor, because this needs to become like a pillar part of our faith walk in our journey. There are so many times where we've got to come to these places where we remember our faith rises up and there's a response in us. Not we heard it somewhere, sounded good on a quote meme somewhere, but this thing takes residency in our spirit that God is good, God is for me, His favor is with me, and I'm living my life from an understanding of that truth. Does that make sense? How many know it can be different and like, oh, I hear something and I, it makes sense versus that's a part of me and I live from that place of faith. So we're going to open up in uh, Romans chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Romans chapter 8. And... The title of the message today is God is for you. God is for you. So let's do this. Let's read a few verses, 31 through 33, uh, and then we'll, we'll start to dig in. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. I'm going to read that again, because that's a big one. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Bless you. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you, God, for your desire, your intention to speak to us, to illuminate things hidden that we could not know apart from you. We know, Lord, that your word, your ways, your will are are not able to be gazed into by the natural man, that you must reveal them to us by your Spirit, and we may peer into those unseen things that are rich for our soul. Would you impart to us, would you minister to us in that way today? We want to know you more, Jesus. We want to see you more. We want to have your ways become our ways, Lord, and your desires become our desires. Fill us with your truth, this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So these verses that I chose to start with, uh, Paul is doing something here where he's essentially kind of summarizing or finishing up a, a long discourse of a bunch of things that he's just talked about, that he's been teaching about, that God offers us uh, as we come into relationship with him as his children, some things that he does and establishes. So he goes through a long list. I'm going to show you a few of them, but time wouldn't permit me to to unpack all of this. Suffice to say 
He's just revealed some of the richest treasure that we know we have in a relationship with Christ Jesus. He comes to this point at the end of chapter 8 where he makes a statement. He says, what then shall we say to these things? Does that kind of make sense? He's sort of like, it, it's a literary device. It's a type of writing where you can really make a dramatic point, kind of wrap some things up and summarize well. You see, how do we respond to all of this then? If everything I just told you is true, and it is, what are we to do with that? And then he makes this statement. He says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? He says, if, if God did all these things that I've just told you about, then tell me this, how, who or what could possibly come against you in your life, in your future, and prevail? You see that. He's trying to anchor something in them so that it goes with them into the future seasons of their life. I love it. It's like a drastic thing. It's like, if, if God did this, he says in, in earlier in chapter 8, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, the shame of sin, you've been clothed in the garment of righteousness. Your nakedness is covered. You have identity in Christ now. That's where you find your security. Boy, that's a big one. He says, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. Boy, that's another powerful bullet point. I mean, think about that one for a second and the implications that that has. Not a diminished form of God's power, like we get a little dose of it. He says, no, the, the same fullness of the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead miraculously, that power lives and resides in you. He says, you're an heir in Christ. You're, you're a joint heir with Christ to the fullness of what this inheritance is has actually been paid for you to have. And we got to come to some revelation of this, that God has purchased a huge inheritance for us. It, it's not waiting to be bought. It's already been bought. Thus, it must already be transferred and us living it out in our lives. Boy, God invites us into this huge destiny and calling and the riches of His glory are being dispensed into the lives of his children. And Paul's saying, man, if all this stuff is true, what are we to do with this? How are we to respond? It's kind of like this. If I were to maybe give you an example, I'd say, uh, let's say I want to get a point across to Mike. I say, Mike, you just came over to my house for a barbecue on Memorial Day weekend big feast. And I say, Mike, come here. I want to I show you some things. I want to show you all that we've got. Come on in here into the kitchen. Look at the, look on the island and look at all of the appetizers and the hors d'oeuvres. Mike, take your pick. What do you like? You like the veggie tray? You like the fruit tray? You like the finger foods? I mean, you name it. You like the dips? Whatever. We've got everything here. Appetizers and hors d'oeuvres. Just take your pick. But, but Mike, there's more. Come outside with me for a second. Let me show you what's in the smoker. You see this great big brisket? This thing's been smoking for the last 12, 14 hours. Oh, it's just mouth watering. And look at all these slabs of ribs, baby back. They've been smoking. They're falling off the bone. They're incredible. And come in here into the kitchen again. I want to show you what's in the oven. We got all these desserts and these cakes and these pies and these cookies. Mike, what then shall we say to these things? Mike, what's the point I'm trying to make to you? Mike, what I'm trying to say is, you're not going home hungry today. <laughs> you see that device, that, that approach? That's what Paul's doing. Okay, That's what he's trying to get across. And the reason I bring all that out is because there's this huge significance in a child of God living their lives knowing God is for you. <laughs> and if he's for you... If he's for you, by way of comparison, who could possibly be against you? None more powerful, none more high up, highest throne, highest name. If that's the one who's for you, just tip the scales, baby. 
God is for me, who or what could possibly be against me? But you know, I think a lot of times people live their lives without an understanding of this truth, without this truth really reflecting itself in their faith walk. Some people get some real mixed up, distorted views of God and what his intentions are towards them in their lives. You know, it, some people don't realize God really is for you. They might think, in many cases, I, I've seen this in people's view, where it's like, well, you know, God, he's, he's God. He's way up there. He's, he's got so much going on. I mean, he's controlling the cosmos and the universe. Like, he, he's, he's unconcerned with what's happening in my daily life. It, it's just not on God's radar. So it's almost like God's indifferent. He's not really for me or against me. He's just, he's God and he's up there. He is God, he's supreme, but it's like this, he's unconcerned, you know, indifferent to what's happening in my daily life. Or perhaps even worse, people that would view God as, you know, just this angry God up here on his throne waiting for them to mess up, make one wrong move, one wrong turn, and boom, he's going to come and strike with the rod, baby, and going to punish them for their misdoings. Well, all I would say is if either of those views are how someone would be looking at God or his intention towards them, then frankly, I don't think they've read the whole book. (laughs) Because that's not the picture that we see conclusively throughout Scripture of our loving Father who's good and gracious to us, whose goodness follows us. And let me say again, a God who is for you. You know, oftentimes bad doctrine and bad theology can be uh, developed in someone's life simply by one particular verse in Scripture that is brought in and embraced and abused and misused and taken entirely out of context. Let me say you can't build a theology around one verse in Scripture. You have to cohesively look at all of the Bible. And what's beautiful about the truth of the Word of God, and I've got encouragement for you today, if you've had those false views, if your relationship towards God is cold and dry, or you're you know, kind of standoffish with Him, the truth of God's Word simultaneously can deconstruct and unravel bad doctrine and bad theology, and at the same time, establish and ground you in good doctrine, good theology that'll take root in your spirit and become a substance of your faith moving forward. And that's what I want for us today is to move forward in our lives knowing in fact that God is for us. In fact, let me say it like this. He's your biggest fan. (laughs) He's cheering you on. He's pulling for you. God has equipped us with everything that we need to fully succeed in the life and the destiny that he's prepared for us. I don't know if you're a parent, a grandparent, and you have kids or grandkids, or maybe some of us, when we were kids, our parents or grandparents would come watch us play sports or activities or whatever, but aren't we like our kids, grandkids, biggest fans. I mean, don't we just cheer them on? When they do something right, I mean, I know my daughter Liza, she's seven, and she just figured out how to do this front walkover, where she does a handspring forward, and then she, you know, pops up. And I'm, I got videos, you know, I'm showing people. I mean, I think she's ready for the Beijing Olympics, you know? <laughs> it's incredible. I expect people's mouth to just drop whenever I show them this video. Unbelievable. Never seen that in my life, you know? So other people, you know, the same way. Little Johnny, he just painted this painting, and he's going to be the next Picasso. And it's a paint by numbers. I mean, <laughs> we, we, can be our, we are our kids' biggest fans. We're pulling for them. We're rooting for them. We're equipping them to succeed, trying to keep them from going anywhere where harm would exist for them. If our earthly mothers and fathers treat us like this, how much more our heavenly Father who loves us with a perfect love. Oh, God is for us. It's so important that we know that because the reality is as you walk out God's purpose and plan for your life, 
you will encounter opposition. There will be many things throughout all the future seasons of your life. You just you have to know this. Jesus said, expect this. You will experience tribulation. You will experience opposition to the forward advancement of God's will and God's ways in your life. But listen to me. It does not have to be a defeat. We are meant to be overcomers. He who's born of God is an overcomer, John tells us, meaning the overcomer nature of Jesus is in us, and we are overcomers by the nature of our relationship with Christ. It doesn't have to be a defeat. In order to live in victory, our faith is going to have to get strong. Our faith is going to have to mature and develop, and we're going to have to remember and live from this reality many times in our lives that God is for us. And whatever it is that I'm experiencing, notice how he says, it doesn't matter who or what is against you if God is for you. He says, none of them, they don't, they're not even in the same category. None of them compare. He says, it doesn't matter what is for you. Well, there are demons and demonic forces that are under Satan's control, constantly attempting to do his bidding by defeating the works of God in the lives of his children. I don't know if you know that, but hell is on a mission to destroy God's work in your life. It doesn't matter what comes against you if God is for you. He says it doesn't matter who. This may come as a surprise to you, but the Bible says that Satan is at work in the sons of disobedience. There are many in the world, humans in the world, who are deceived and manipulated by the forces of hell that are set to work against the things of God in your life. So if God is doing a new thing, He's doing something in your life, He's calling you out into a new season of adventurous faith and risk in stepping out from Him, there's a really good possibility you'll come face to face with the what or the who that would be up against you very soon. And the who, if, if people are rooting against you, how many know that that happens? God's doing something, there are people rooting against you, hoping you fail. There's all kinds of reasons for that. I'm not going to unpack all that today, but there are people who will root against us. And I want to say something to you about that today, and I want to say it very lovingly, but I want to toughen your faith muscle. When people root against you, so what? Is that? I'll say that again. So what? I'm not saying relationships aren't relevant in our life and we don't have to work through things. We do. That's a given. Here's what I'm saying. Those things are of absolutely no consequence and they pose absolutely no threat to the victory and promises of God coming to pass in your life. They're inconsequential. God is for us. You know, David, King David, he lived his life uh, on just so many different seasons, situations that he experienced. But man, he lived his life really in tune to the, the reality that God was for him. I mean, he faced a lot of enemies. He had Saul wanting to kill him. His son Absalom chased him down to kill him. I mean, he went through a lot of stuff. And David, towards the end of his life, had a lot of words to share. 2 Samuel 22 is where we're going to go here in just a moment. But these are kind of the final words of David. Now, how many people know when somebody has some final reflective thoughts that they want to pass on to the next generation at the end of their life, and they've lived their life close with God, there's some pretty important things that we need to pay attention to there. And so I want, to, I want you to hear some things that David shares, because for me, this, this revelation that God is for me, his favor and goodness are with me, pursuing me, God's the defender of my reputation. I spent so much of my early life in the smoke screens, 
the ancillary battles that had nothing to do with the core mission that the enemy just constantly tries to distract us with. God's the defender of my reputation. I don't need to go out here, explain myself here, explain myself here. I spent my whole life trying to help people understand their misunderstandings of my intention, and that's not my core mission. Winston Churchill said, if you stop to throw stones at every dog that barks along the way, you'll never arrive at your destination. We've got to come to this place where we live our lives knowing God is for us, and if anything is against us. It's irrelevant as long as God is for us. Strengthening our faith muscle. Solomon said in Proverbs that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. This isn't a demeaning comment. It's a challenge. It's a call up to a higher place. Get strong in your faith. Mature in your faith. Live on the solid nourishment of the word. And don't be babes in Christ throughout the rest of your lifetime here on this earth. We've got to get a strong faith if we're going to stomp our foot on the forces of hell the way that we're intended to. So let's listen to what David says in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 7. Let's start there. He says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry entered his ears. Hallelujah. Boy, that is a beautiful picture right there for children of God. And then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens down and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherubim and he flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. Let me stop there for a moment. This is a glorious picture that David is so poetically describing. In fact, much of the language in 2 Samuel 22 goes on into the Psalms as well, where David composed many of those. It's a, essentially kind of a, a worship, an overflow, an explosion out of what's in him and his relationship with God that he's expressing in the writings here. And I love this because he's really painting a picture for us of what a loving, protective father looks like when his children are in trouble. You see that? He says, I called out in my distress, and the Lord's ears heard my cry. And then he says, heaven and earth began to shake, and God began to move. He says, smoke comes out of his nostrils because he is angry that someone is messing with one of his kids. And this is the way that God, as a loving father, relates to us as well. If you're a parent, grandparent, a, a, a caregiver, you know if one of your children who are young and in need are crying out for help in time of need, they're in danger, they're being attacked. I mean, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, something snaps in you and everything else stops and you part everything you've got apart to get to your child, to protect them, to take care of them and make sure they are safe. Once again, I say if we as heavenly or earthly mothers and fathers know how to take care of our kids this way, how much more our heavenly father who is for us is willing to shake heaven and earth and move upon the wind to come to the aid of one of his children who are in need. Oh, this is the God that we serve and he is for us. He goes on to say this in verse 20 in chapter 22. David says, he also has brought me out into a broad place and delivered me because he delighted in me. So this particular verse, I've got my Bibles all you know, highlighted up and stuff. I've got this one in pink and red. This one really jumped out to me a number of years ago. 
He set my feet in a broad place. One of the reasons it did is because I recognized that this is common language that I've seen other places in Scripture. I've heard this type of wording before. That's one of the reasons it's really important to get a lot of the Word in you. As you put the Word of God in you again and again and again, there are times in your life where you're going to come into a situation or you're going to be reading the Word and something's going to kind of rise out of you. I know what to do with that. Oh, I've read that before. I've seen that. I've heard that before. So I was just language of he put my feet in a broad place. I've seen that other places in scripture. Uh, God's wanting to say something to me about this. Later on in chapter 22, he says it this way in verse 37, you've enlarged my path under my feet or under me so my feet do not slip. Listen to this, more language like this, Psalms 31 verse 8, you have set my feet in a wide place. Psalms 118.5, the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me. Don't you love that? Proverbs 4.12, when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. This picture began to unfold. God's showing me, you know, my feet on this path that God is enlarging before me, solid ground, safe and secure. He's making it broad and expansive. Here's why that's so important. I think many times people live their lives with God, thinking about this, the commands of Scripture. God compels us to live a life like this. He's got a plan for us. And we live our lives. You ever see those images uh, or videos of somebody like walking over a huge canyon on a tightrope, like those crazy people, they got no safety harness or anything. You ever see that and you think like, one wrong move and they're gone. I mean, I wonder if, if some of them didn't make it, you know? I mean, that's a huge thing. I think sometimes we live our lives with God and we think it's almost like this tightrope. Oh God, I can't make one wrong move. Oh Lord, I've got to make sure I Pick the right person to marry. Oh, if I mess that one up, Lord. Oh, I got to make sure I, I take that job or don't take that job if that's the one where I move, God. Oh, if I, if I screw up one time and I mess up, oh. Like it's this tightrope experience. And that's impossible to walk out if we're constantly thinking that One wrong move is going to derail us entirely from God's promises coming to pass in our life. You see this picture that David sees that I see that I want you to see? He says, no, he's enlarging the path beneath your feet. He's setting you in a broad place where there's plenty of safe room and footing to move around in the sanctity and the security and the blanketing of his goodness, of his grace and of his favor. Stretch out. Be adventurous in your faith. Take risk for God, knowing that he's for you. He's good to you. He's pursuing you with his goodness And he's making your path broad that you may walk out in confidence the things that he wants to do in and through you. Wow. But if we think we're treading a tightrope and one wrong move is going to blow the whole deal, it's just a matter of time before you throw in the towel. Who could live up to that? And then what happens is we slip back into the shadows, complacency. Never allowing our faith to be adventurous, to be courageous, to take big risks for a God who says, I'm for you. I've always been for you. I'm for you in every season of your life. That's unchanging. It's part of my unchanging nature towards you. I'm cheering you on and I'm rooting for you and I'm equipping you with everything that you need to succeed. And then we can be bold and step out and know that this God who's done all these miraculous things for us is inviting us into a life 
of supernatural possibilities in a realm where the only thing that exists is what he says is possible, which is all things by his power, instead of living our lives within the parameters of only what's naturally attainable. You can't tread out into that invisible realm unless there's something solid in you that knows and lives it, doesn't just say it. God, it's for me in all seasons, in all things. And if he's for me, baby, I don't care what comes against me or who comes against me. God is for me, and he's securing the victory. Oh, you just live differently. I don't know if you've ever went on a trip or traveled somewhere and you use your GPS. Probably everybody has here at some point now. And you know what's amazing about GPS? My wife can't live without it. I mean, she's just like, Siri shuts down. I don't, she's going to be in a cornfield somewhere. I don't. <laughs> but what's amazing about GPS is that as long as you plot your final coordinate, your destination, your endpoint into the program, it maps a route out for you to get there, the best route. And then you take that route. But if for some reason as you're traveling, you get caught, distracted by a billboard, caught up in a conversation in the car, and all of a sudden you miss a turn. You know, GPS has a miraculous ability. It's called what? Rerouting. All of a sudden, there's a new path. And, and that becomes the new one. And that becomes the right one. As long as the endpoint is programmed properly as our destination, then you could say GPS will always know how to lead you and guide you to get where it is that you're trying to go. Here's what I'm trying to say. I want you to live your life in adventure. I want you to live your life in faith, knowing God is for you. He's enlarging your path so your feet don't slip. He's giving you broad footing to tread out into. Jesus says this. Seek first the kingdom of God and all things. I mean... That's an infinite list. All things that you would ever need to do what God wants you to do. Seek first the kingdom of God. All things shall be provided unto you. Seek first. That's two, two implications. First. One is priority. What's he saying? My kingdom, my ways, my will always have to be number one. So much so that your will takes a back seat. That's a big place we got to get to. Lay down our life, surrender our will, that we may actually lay hold of or gain true life. My kingdom, Jesus' will for my life, is always number one. Because there's times where my flesh and my emotions would compete with that. You understand what I'm saying? And yours too. His way is number one. And ours is always willing to take a back seat. Guess what? He'll keep that path going where it needs to go. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. God has this miraculous ability. I, I still can't wrap my head around this one at all. That he says, I'll work everything out together for your good. Even the bad stuff. Even the past mistakes. I'll turn, I'll turn ashes into beauty. Hey, rerouting you. I mean, but his will, his ways, it's got to be number one. First is priority. Let me tell you something else first means. Sequential order of events. God's will, his kingdom, how this is going to build the kingdom of God, advance the church and God's mission in the world, is my leading thought. It's the first step. 
We don't look at a new season, a new endeavor, a new project, whatever, and think, okay, how's this going to affect me? How's this going to affect my situation? I'm not saying we don't ever have those thoughts. What I'm saying is they ought not to be our first thoughts. Speak first, sequential, order of events. Anything in my life, God, your will is the most important thing. I want it more than anything else. And I'm seeking that first. Let that be my compass and let that be my guide and my path will be sure and straight. I know and I can trust you for that because your word says it's true. Hallelujah. We seek first the kingdom of God and we know our footing will be secure. God will make a path. It'll be broad and we can live boldly, adventurously, and confidently in faith knowing at all seasons and at all times, say it with me, God is for you. Amen. I invite the team back up. Would you stand to your feet today as we begin to close? And I feel like as we wrap this message up, that the Lord wants to just minister to some folks, encourage some folks here today. And here's the situation that I discern that some people are probably in. You've stepped out into something not so long ago. You feel like God's leading you. You feel like there's a, a there's purpose. But you've kind of hit this point where it seems like you've stalled out. It, it seems like you're kind of in a, this sort of this valley, this shallow place. Like, whoa, did I make a wrong turn? <laughs> did I miss something? going on and you're you're frankly if you're willing to admit it you're disappointed possibly even a little bit discouraged boy that's the devil's handiwork and I feel like the Lord just wants to remind you today and, and say to you I, I don't have the blueprint for you I don't have the next 30 days mapped out I, I don't really know what all that looks like but I think what's paramount <laughs> is that God wants to remind you. He wants to get this deep in your spirit. No matter who or what possibly comes against you, please know that God is for you. And that makes all the difference in the world. You see, Jesus says, any good work that I begin in your life, I'm faithful to complete it. Meaning our God's not a quitter. <laughs> he's a finisher. And if he's begun something in your life, he intends to finish it. You may be in a bit of a haze. You may have some unanswered questions. That's part of the journey. But in times like that, we've got to step back. Our faith muscle has to flex. We've got to get strong. And we've got to remember some of the greater truths of Scripture establish pillars of solid doctrine, good theology, our faith applicable and operative in the situation and say, you know what? It doesn't matter who or what's against me. God, my God, he's good. He's always good. His goodness is pursuing me and he is for me. The scales are tipped, baby. The victory's been secured. I just need to walk it out now. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. And I pray right now, Lord, those who are here, those who are watching online, anywhere and everywhere, that this would be heard. Where there is disappointment, where there is discouragement, where that evil spirit from hell known as despair is lurking and looming and waiting to strike in people's lives. We come against that with the sword of the Spirit of God. We come against that with the truth of Scripture, the perfect knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we say, God, you are for us. Would you minister and encourage all who are in need of that right now, Lord, in this place, online, everywhere, God, that people would hear this message. Would you encourage your people? Would you raise us up strong in our faith? To know in all seasons, mighty God, that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Hey, listen, if you're here today and you need prayer for anything at all, maybe you're going through a difficulty, maybe you just are in a place where you say, you know what, I, I don't know where I stand with Jesus. Let me ask you this. If you died today and you can't say for certain you know you'd be in heaven, perhaps you need to settle that. Perhaps there needs to be a moment here where we come to know that Jesus is our Savior. He offers us forgiveness of sin, and He invites us into a life of destiny and the promise of eternity with Him. You say, man, I, I want that prayer today. In fact, you know what? Just for a moment, if everybody could just bow their heads and close their eyes. I think I just want to ask you, if that's you, you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ. I'm not sure where I stand with him. I'm ready to let go of the world and lay hold of him. I'm ready to sell out for Jesus. Seek first his ways. You've never had that kind of surrender moment. Perhaps it's time today for you to step into a new relationship with Christ. Be given life and life abundantly and eternally. Or maybe you've walked with God in the past and you've drifted away. You've found yourself off course. Those words about needing to get rerouted maybe clicked something in you and it's time to kind of come back to walking with Christ. If either of those situations describe you while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'd just like to invite you uh, to join me in prayer this morning. I'll lead you in this prayer, but it's an expression of your heart it's a sign of your love towards God and what you desire to have with Him. And God will meet you where you are. Say, I'm going to surrender my life and walk with Christ, or I'm going to come back. Either one of those situations are you. On the count of three, I ask you to raise your hand just so I can see who you are and lead you in this prayer. This is your moment today if the Spirit of God is tugging on you. Say, I need that, Pastor. On the count of three. One, two, three. Three, would you raise your hand? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I see your hand. God bless you. You can put it down. If there's anybody else in this place today, the Lord is working on you. The Spirit is drawing you. I'll just appeal to you. Don't, don't walk away without responding. That simple hand sliding up, that's just, and it just shows where your heart is at. That's all. It's just an abandonment saying, yeah, I say yes to you, God, and what you have for me. One more time. Is there anybody else in this place? And if you're watching online, this is for you as well. So let's just join together in prayer. You can raise your head, look at me. And those that raise their hand, just join me in this. Everybody will join together. This is, this is your prayer, meaning of your heart. God's going to meet you where you are today. I'm so excited for you. The blessings of the Lord are rich and abundant. And he's going to lead you into the greatest adventure and destiny that you could ever imagine. So much better than you could ever create on your own. You say, dear Father God, I give my life to you today. I call upon the name of Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I turn away from the world. I let go of material things that I may lay hold of the upward call of Jesus Christ on my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new creation. Your life and power would live in me. Help me, God, to become the person you've created me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the Lord bless you, encourage you. May your sleep be sweet. May your smile be wide. And may your joy be full. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise for what he's doing in this place today. Hallelujah. Will the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and may he give you peace. Go in the peace and favor and the strength of the Lord. Have a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. God bless you, everyone.